Hi, everyone. Hold on to your horses and tighten up your britches. Today, I have yet another set of shocking stories that are sure to make your head spin. You might even learn the truth about something that makes it impossible for you to sleep tonight. So get yourself comfortable, grab your favorite drink, and cozy up with that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. To start this out, I grew up in West Virginia, and I've heard all the stories about the creatures in the woods. My grandfather was superstitious and always told me that the land we lived on did not belong to us. I kind of brushed all the superstitious stuff aside because I never saw or experienced anything personally. That is, until about a week ago when something bizarre happened. I live with my husband, but he had picked up an extra shift at work, and I wasn't expecting him home until 2 a.m., so I was home alone. I often have trouble sleeping when he's not home, so I was up watching some late-night cartoons with my cat. It was about 11 o'clock at night when I heard my husband Jim call my name. I was surprised that he was home so early. Usually he sends a text when he's on his way, but I yelled to him that I was in bed watching TV and then just waited expecting him to walk through the bedroom door. A few minutes passed, but he didn't come in. I called for him again and waited for a response. For a moment, I thought I might have imagined hearing him call my name, but at the same time, part of me was on alert. I muted the TV and I listened carefully for any sounds from downstairs. After a moment, I heard him call my name again. Yes, it was the exact same voice I've heard every day for the past three years. I was instantly at ease. Then he called my name again. There's no inflection in the voice, though. Nothing to indicate what he was calling me for. It sounded a bit off, too, but I just figured he was tired or something. What is it? I finally yelled. I was sitting on the edge of the bed now with the remote in my hand. He called my name again, but this time it sounded further away. I finally stood up from the bed and I walked over to the door. I flipped the hall light on. And just so you know, I watch way too many horror movies where they all walk around in the dark, so I wasn't about to do that. I looked down the stairs, expecting to see Jim standing there, but the hall was completely empty. So I slowly started walking down the stairs. I mean, I was on edge already, and now I was getting worse. Something about this was totally creeping me out. I called out for Jim again, but didn't get a response. I walked through the house, and I flipped on every light looking for him. Eventually, I made it to the kitchen. I turned on the light and instantly noticed that the kitchen door leading outside to the back of the house was cracked open. Every part of my body screamed at me to turn around and go back upstairs, and I wish I would have listened, but I moved forward. I knew I heard Jim, and I wasn't going to go back until I saw him in case something was wrong. I opened the kitchen door the rest of the way and stood there in the doorway. We lived right at the edge of the woods. My grandfather owned the house before us, and he passed it down to me, and he had built a large barn where he used to raise goats. I stared at the barn for a moment, wondering why in the hell the light was on out there. We don't use the barn at all. It's old and rickety, and the wood is waterlogged and rotten. It isn't even safe to use for storage. I yelled for Jim again, but didn't get any response. All I could think about was why he would be in the barn this late at night, let alone home yet from work. I slipped on a pair of boots sitting by the door and started walking towards the barn. The closer I got to it, I could hear these shuffling sounds inside, like somebody was walking across the old crunchy hay. I heard my name being called again, but this time it didn't come from the barn. The voice came from the woods, beside me. I stopped mid-stride with my eyes locked on the open barn door. I was about halfway between the barn and the house and completely petrified. And then, without any noise leading up to it, the light in the barn shut off. And now in the darkness I could see a pair of glowing yellow eyes. I immediately turned and booked it back to the house, slamming the kitchen door shut and locking it. I grabbed one of the kitchen knives and I hurried up the stairs to grab my phone. I was about to call the police when I saw a message from Jim. He had texted me saying he wouldn't be home until 7 a.m. because he was able to pick up overtime hours said don't wait up for him. It felt like my heart stopped beating when I read that. I knew for sure now that whoever or whatever had called my name wasn't Jim. I immediately dialed 911 and I explained to them that someone had just been in my house calling my name 
and that I had seen someone in my barn and asked them to send a patrol car right away. One of the downsides of living in a small town in the country is how far you are from everything, how isolating it can be. It took 30 minutes for the police to arrive. It felt like hours. I was crouching on the floor in the corner beside my bed with the knife in my hand. The entire time I was waiting for the police, I kept hearing Jim's voice call my name. It felt like it grew more desperate every time it called, and it was horrifying. As soon as I saw the lights from the cop car, I ran outside to safety. He walked the perimeter of my property, but said he didn't see any signs of anyone. And even more terrifying, the barn didn't look like anybody had stepped foot in it in ages. He told me to get some sleep and I could tell that he thought it was all my imagination. Well, I didn't sleep at all, to be honest. I drove over to where Jim works and just sat in the car in the parking lot until he was off. I don't know who or what I'd seen and heard in our house that night, but I know it had to be something supernatural. Oh yeah, and by the way, we've since gotten a German shepherd who now never leaves my side. I should start by saying that I'm not typically prone to believing in stories of strange creatures. I mean, I've always been a serious person with a serious job. I'm a chief warrant officer, and I've been in the Navy for 25 years. I've spent plenty of time in the wild. I started hunting with my dad when I was 12. I've never been one to scare easily. I've been in combat, and I had to deal with all kinds of dicey situations. Anyway... My buddy Bill and I liked to go hunting wild pigs on my cousin's farm down in Florida. It's just a little south of Jacksonville. I would never go alone. It's a two-person job. One person would man the spotlight and the other would have a rifle. We would roam through the cornfields until we heard animals rustling around, and then we would hit them with the spotlight and take our shots. The time I'm talking about, we went out on a night in January. It was pretty cold, probably down in the 40s. We drove out there, and then we walked out to a field where we had known the pigs to hang out. We settled in to listen. There was no moon, and it was cloudy, so it was just about as dark as you could get. It was just the right conditions to get the pigs. It wasn't too long before we started hearing some rustling and grunting. Bill hit the spotlight, and we saw five or six pretty big pigs. I had my rifle ready, and I fired at the biggest pig, and I downed him with a shot behind the ear. The rest of the pigs panicked, and I got off about three more shots, but they went kind of high, and the pigs made it to the tree line. My ears were ringing, and my adrenaline was pumping. I was really wishing I had gotten more than one. We started walking toward the one on the ground, but as soon as I took a step toward it, we heard a scream. It was a loud, angry scream, and it sounded like it was close. I was like, what the hell is that? And Bill looked at me, all freaked out. He shone the light around and scanned the open field and the trees at the edge. We couldn't see anything. He started to say something, but then we heard the scream again, and it seemed even closer and louder. It was really loud, but really raspy, too. Like if you went to a football game and screamed and hollered and wound up losing half your voice. And the next day, you tried to scream as loud as you could for ten seconds. That's what it sounded like. Bill said, give me your pistol. We need to get out of here. I had a pistol on me along with the rifle. I handed him my forty-five. But I said, what about the pig? He said, screw the pig. We were about a mile away from the truck on a thousand-acre farm, with some kind of demon thing screaming at us in the pitch black. We started to feel panicky. We found the track we had followed in and started to walk away fast, but we kept turning back to scan the area, thinking we were about to see something come after us. And then we heard it again, and turned around, and we saw this thing on the path about 50 feet away. This creature was only about four feet tall, but it was staring at us with these crazy red eyes. It had spikes down its back with leathery gray skin. It looked hairless to me, and it gave us this weird grin, and I swear it looked like it only had like three long teeth in the front of its mouth. Its hind legs looked huge. It was like we were paralyzed trying to figure out what in the hell we were looking at. And then Bill remembered that he had the pistol and he raised it and the thing took off into the corn. We finally came to our senses and started running full speed toward the truck. I don't remember if there were any more screams, 
My adrenaline was way up and all my focus was on running as fast as I could without tripping or falling. We made it back to the truck and I hightailed it back to my cousin's house. On the ride home, we were trying to calm ourselves down. But Bill just kept saying, what the hell was that? No freaking way that was a hog. And all I could say was, it sure wasn't. We got back to my cousin's house where they had made a bonfire and we were standing around. We must have looked pretty wild-eyed because my cousin came over and handed us two beers right away and was like, rough night? Did you get a pig? Yeah, we left the pig out there. Maybe we'll get it in the morning. He looked pretty confused and then we both just started telling him about the crazy screaming and he said, yeah, raccoons can make some really wild noises. Then we told him what we saw and he seemed to get a little pale and he started telling us about this weird thing that had happened with his neighbor's sheep the week before. He said almost 10 sheep had been found slaughtered, and they were completely drained of blood with this strange puncture marks on their chests. We could tell he felt weird about saying this, but then he said that the neighbor thought a chupacabra had gotten them. I'd heard that word before, but I thought it was just some weird legend from South America or something. And that was that. We got the pig the next day, we felt okay going out there in the daylight, but honestly, I don't know that I'd want to be out there in the dark ever again. It was summer in Oklahoma, and I was about 10, maybe 11. That day, my grandma picked up me and my younger sister from daycare, and we had gone to eat pizza and then go grocery shopping. By this point, it was right after dark, and we were taking the same way home that we did every time. But that night everything was going to be different. The roads were empty, but that wasn't strange in our county where there weren't a ton of people. I always loved the way the trees lit up when the headlights hit them, and I was watching them out the window as we drove by, trying not to be dizzy as they raced past. We were in Grandma's truck, and so my little sister was in the middle seat, and she was playing around with the radio. Par for the course for a little kid. She got bored easily. But what wasn't normal was when Grandma looked up and started pointing. Of course, this caught my attention. I looked up too, but I couldn't understand why she was freaking out at first. But it didn't take me long to figure it out. Up ahead, above the tree line, we could see three lights. They were just floating there in the sky. And that's when I noticed that my hair started to float up a bit, like it was staticky, and everything around just felt wrong. The trees weren't moving. I heard my grandma gasp, and then she pulled off the road and into this open field next to us. We sat in the truck, and we both watched as this thing stayed in one place, just hanging there in the sky. Also, it was creepy quiet. You couldn't hear any noises coming from the thing, like you would if it was a plane or a helicopter, or any animal noises around either. It was as if we were in this silent bubble, watching the thing hover there in one place. There was no movement, no wind, just absolute stillness. I couldn't believe my eyes, and Grandma obviously couldn't either. She had opened her door and stood with one foot on the ground and one still in the truck with her hand gripping the steering wheel. She looked like she was ready to jump back in and slam her door at any second. I remember looking over at her and seeing that her grip was so tight that her knuckles were white. My unshakable grandma was obviously shaken. Meanwhile, my little sister was excited about the pretty lights we were looking at. She was too young to know that this wasn't normal. Even though it was still warm from the heat of the day, I shivered, and I was covered in goosebumps all over my body. My hair still stood on end, and it all just felt wrong. Everything was telling me that we needed to run, to get out of there. I didn't understand how I knew that we needed to get out of there, but I knew it. I was scared, and I yelled for Grandma to get in the truck, begging her to get us home. When she finally heard me, she jumped back in and slammed the truck into gear. The tires spun in the grass before we got traction, but once they grabbed, we were racing home. But even as we put distance between us and that thing, that electric feeling didn't go away right away. I spun around, and it was still in the same spot, not following us, but it was now spinning. The lights were going around and around and I could see another light underneath it, like a beam shining down. But aside from spinning, it wasn't moving, it wasn't following us, it wasn't retreating. It just stayed in that one place, spinning faster and faster like a top. I screamed at Grandma to hurry. 
I wanted her to put as much distance between us and that thing as possible. And then my sister started crying. She was confused because we were obviously scared and she didn't know why. She was only four or five and had never seen two people at once being super afraid. I kept my eyes on the object until we turned off the road and I couldn't see it anymore. Only then did I turn back to the front to try to calm my sister down. I wrapped my arm around her and I asked her to show me what was on the radio stations that she had been bouncing between. Even as I comforted her, our grandma kept mumbling to herself, like under her breath, saying, I've never seen anything like that. What was that? The rest of the ride home was spent with each of us checking the mirrors and looking back over our shoulders. Even though we couldn't see it anymore, we still felt super uneasy and scared. I was personally terrified it would show back up. I didn't know what it was. I thought I might, but Grandma wasn't talking about it right then. We got home and ran inside, sending my dad back to the truck to get the groceries. Even though the truck was in the garage, I didn't want to go back outside. He didn't understand why we were so shaken. We tried to explain that to him, but he brushed us off. I think he first thought we were just messing with him. Until the phone rang. My dad's friend, who worked at the town office, called him and started telling him that there had been numerous reports of sightings of this weird thing hovering in the sky, over near where we lived. We lived in a small town where everybody knows everything, so it was no surprise that the news was traveling fast. But still, an unusual sighting shouldn't be an emergency. I could tell from listening that his friend thought it was funny that people were calling in and just wanted to share it with my dad. But when the call ended, my dad turned to us, and the smiling face he had on while talking to his friend had now changed. He had been going along with his friend and hadn't said anything about what we had seen. But now, he looked at us, and I could tell he believed us. I was so relieved that other people had seen it. I didn't feel as crazy, but even now, all these years later, I don't talk about that night. We always just kept it within our family that we had also seen it. At least, until now that I'm telling you and finally getting it off my chest. But no matter what, that night will be burned into my memory forever. Most especially, I won't forget the way that that energy field felt. That was freaky. I wish we could have gotten an answer, any answer. But just knowing that other people saw it too, helps. Over the years, I have heard of stories leaking out of national parks about strange creatures, beings that people can't understand. I've never personally experienced any myself, but I always wondered if there was any truth to these stories. So you can imagine how intrigued I was recently when I was talking to a friend about this. He told me that his father-in-law always talked about seeing something strange something that was definitely alive but looked nothing like anything he had ever seen before, and that it had happened decades ago. Of course, this all piqued my interest, but what really added to the intrigue was that this happened to him while he was working in Oregon, at Crater Lake National Park, back in the 60s. He was assigned to the North Rim area of the caldera and was working on a trail project. He was clearing brush and doing a lot of repair work, and one night he realized he had forgotten his work bag, and so he went back to the work site soon after clocking out to get it. He was there on the north rim and began walking along the trail that led to where he had been working, and it was then that he felt a presence, like something was watching him. He says that at the time he had no idea what it was, but he knew that it was definitely there. He continued walking, and shortly thereafter heard a strange singing noise coming from the forest, like a woman or a child was out there. He says it was haunting and strange, and he said it seemed to be coming from the direction where he had been working, which made him apprehensive about continuing. He actually became so concerned that he decided he would just retrieve the bag the next day. So he turned around, started to head back to his truck. He began walking back, but it wasn't long before he heard footsteps walking in the distance behind him, following him. He turned around but saw no one, so he quickened his step and continued walking, and at the time he then again heard footsteps following him, now keeping pace with him. They walked when he walked, they stopped when he stopped. He said it wasn't long before he felt a strong sense of danger 
So he then started to run back to his truck. And then just before arriving there, he turned around and that's when he saw it. When he turned around, he saw the whites of two eyes looking at him, piercing at him from the darkness. He also felt again that strong sense of evil. As he stared in the direction of the eyes, the rest of the creature then slowly revealed itself to him. What he saw was completely pale gray in color, and he said that it kept low to the ground, and yet it was able to move very fast at the same time. He said that he was only about 20 feet away from it when he saw it. He said then that it paused when he stopped at his truck, and it looked up at him with large, black, round eyes that seemed to be too big for its head, almost alien-like in appearance. It stared at him without moving or blinking at all, but soon quickly turned and disappeared into the undergrowth. After standing there shocked for a minute or two, he then stepped forward to try to find it, and he looked around continually for about an hour or so, but couldn't locate anything. No sign of it at all. He said that he had worked in the park for years, and he knew that area like the back of his hand, so he was surprised that nothing showed itself that was out of place. He then decided to give up and started heading back to get to his truck, but he found that in good conscience he didn't want to do that, thinking that the creature could be dangerous, and with people in that area every day, who knows what could happen. And so he returned to where he saw it, and now there were some tracks which looked like dog tracks but bigger than they should have been. And also what struck him as odd was that it looked like there were only four toes on each print rather than five that you would expect from a normal dog. So after looking at these tracks for a few minutes, trying to work out what made them, he had this very strange sensation while standing there. He said his mind seemed to blank out and he couldn't remember why he was there or what had happened there. So he then decided to leave the area and head home which he was able to do without incident. But the next day, while at work, his boss rang him and asked him if he had seen anything strange in that area when he was there earlier, since another worker had reported seeing something unusual also. He said yes, and proceeded to describe the creature with gray skin and eyes that were like black holes. But his boss was dismissive to that description and tried to offer up explanations that didn't entertain an unknown creature. The boss was almost even patronizing about it to the point where he made the friend's father-in-law go back with him to look at the area again and look for the tracks. Once they arrived to the area and after looking around a few minutes, he remembers that his mind seemed to go blank again. He blacked out a little bit just like before, and when he looked up from the tracks, his boss was gone. He then looked down at his watch and over two hours had passed. It was now noon and he couldn't remember the previous two hours and that terrified him. He walked back to the parking lot hoping to find his truck, and thankfully it was there. He got in and immediately returned to the main building where he found his boss sitting in his office. He walked up to his boss's office, asked him about what had happened, but his boss just looked up as if nothing had happened, and asked how his day was going, very nonchalantly. At that point, my friend's father-in-law knew that what he was experiencing was not normal at all, and the thought crossed his mind that it might even be extraterrestrial or some other kind of unworldly creature that had played with his mind. But he had no idea what. That day he went home early because he had been left very shaken up, but just said he wasn't feeling well. Ultimately, it apparently took quite some time before he told his story, as it obviously had shaken him up quite badly. Now I've known my friend who told me this about his father-in-law for many years, and he's a very straight-up guy who would not tell stories to make people uncomfortable, or laugh even. He told me this story just like I've told you without adding any embellishments. And also, his father-in-law was quite a private person and never really talked about what he saw to anyone else other than immediate family. So that makes me sure that he did not make up the story. So after hearing this story from the family directly, I thought that perhaps you all might be interested in hearing it, which is why I'm sharing it with you here. It seems that there could be more truth behind some of those National Park stories after all. I hope this helps someone. Thank you. I had been working seasonally at Grand Teton National Park for about three years when what I'm about to tell you happened to me. I was working at Jenny Lake Campground, and this was during the summer of 95. 
The campground is usually pretty slow in mid to late August, given that kids are heading back to school, so I decided to go hiking on one of my days off. On this particular day, I decided to hike the Phelps Lake Loop Trail just south of Jenny Lake. It was a nice day with some clouds, but no rain or any other poor conditions in the forecast. I got to the trailhead about 10.30 and started hiking up through forested areas until I reached an area where there are several trails that branch out from the main one, leading to the lake. I took a left onto one of these smaller trails that I knew would eventually lead me back to the main trail, and then I hiked about a mile and a half when I noticed that it was starting to get cloudy and windy. I thought to myself that it was strange since there had been no call in the forecast for that type of weather. The wind was coming down off the mountain, but I just pushed on with my hike. After hiking a bit further, I stopped to take a few minutes to enjoy the view before I started back down the trail I had come up on, and it was about this time that I noticed something moving in the trees to my left about 30 yards away. At first, I thought it might be a moose or elk since there are many of those in the area, and as I watched to see what it was, whatever it was moved from tree to tree, stayed behind them, but then closer to me until it came out into an open area where I could see it better. When I first got a good look at it, it looked like something I had seen in a National Geographic magazine. Like an animal that you would see in a country far away, but not in what's essentially your own backyard. It was about seven feet tall, covered in reddish-brown hair, and it had this long snout with tusk-like teeth protruding from it in a way that made me think of a warthog. The eyes were dark, and the ears were small and pointed straight up. And then, in between the ears, there were these horns that looked to be about 8 to 10 inches long. I thought to myself that maybe this was some kind of a rare mountain goat or something like that. As I stood there, watching it for several minutes, trying to figure out what it was, trying to figure out if something like this even exists, even if it was really out of place here in Wyoming, it started walking towards me, at this strange sideways angle, almost so as not to expose its full body to me. Now that was strange in and of itself to see it walking like that, but then when it got within 15 yards of me, I noticed that the front legs looked more like human arms than anything else, and it was walking on them in this sort of ape-like kind of way. And so now my brain was really trying to process understanding an animal that looked part mountain goat and part ape. Needless to say, I was starting to get really scared at this point, because I had no idea what it was, and it kept inching closer to me. And then when it got within about 10 yards of me, I noticed that the horns were actually quite pointed on the tips, and the creature was starting to hold its head down, down in a way that the tips were pointing right at me. At this point, I thought for sure that this must be some sort of a rare breed of mountain animal or something like that, since... There's no such thing that should exist like this. As it came even closer to me, now only five yards away, I could see the eyes much more clearly now, as it would periodically look up at me, presumably to keep me in its sights. And then it looked almost human-like, except for the fact that the eyes were very large and lifeless, black as coal in color. The face also now looked sort of ape-like. The mouth was open. I could see these tusk-like teeth, though, again, and it had the strange odor that reminded me of a wet dog mixed with something else that I can't really describe. I thought to myself, if this thing attacks me, I'm dead. And just then it proceeded to do something that scared me even more than when it was coming at me with its horns pointed at me. It held its head upwards towards the sky and started making a sound that sounded like a cross between a human scream and an ape's hoot or howl. At this point, I turned around and ran as fast as I could back down the trail towards the main junction. I didn't look back until after I had run about half a mile down the trail, away from where I had originally encountered this thing. When I did finally look back, there was nothing to be seen. All was quiet and normal looking. So I continued hiking down the trail, which was about another mile and a half, until I reached where my car was. I didn't tell anybody about this encounter when it happened, not family, not co-workers, because they would have thought that I had been drinking or something like that. 
My co-workers especially would be skeptical since they all knew that no such animal existed in those mountains. At least, according to most people who live around there or work at the park. So I just kept my head down and continued doing my job. I even continued doing it every summer until I was in my late 20s and finally settled down and got married. I was eventually able to push this experience to the back of my mind and only think about it as if it was some movie I had watched or a story I had read. But then, a few years later, when the internet got more popular and after listening to some stories on your channel, Lilith, I realized that I may never know exactly what I saw. It doesn't seem to fit any exact description I've heard from anyone else, but I do know that it wasn't a mountain goat, or an ape, or any other animal native to those mountains. It was 100% something else entirely. Hi Lilith, I'm just sending you here a quick explanation of something really strange that happened to me about five years ago. I was at my friend's house having a bonfire and we were all sitting around relaxing and talking when something caught our attention. The sky to the west looked like it had been completely lit on fire, but there wasn't any lightning or thunder, just this huge red glow. We had a really good view of it too because this took place in Montana where the sky is huge and you can see really, really far in every direction. So it seemed like whatever this was would start high in the sky and then move down towards the horizon very quickly. We watched this for about 15 minutes as it kept moving up and down repeatedly until it disappeared behind some trees. Now we were at his house all the time, and even after that first night, we would still see lights flashing around his property, but nothing like what we saw that first time. And then a few months later, he got called into work early one morning. We had all spent the night there. We were all awake when he got up. So myself and another friend decided to go out riding ATVs before sunrise. That's sort of common to do here. So we went out to a trail that goes through some state land where you can ride pretty much wherever you want. We were about halfway through when we came to a clearing and saw something in the distance that looked like it was on fire, but there wasn't any smoke or smell coming from it. Just that same red glow that we had seen before. And now this thing was hovering just above the ground. And then as we were watching it, all of a sudden it darted straight up into the sky and disappeared behind some low-lying clouds. I've never seen a UFO before, but I knew right away that that's what this was. I was sure of it. We had no idea what to do next, so we just turned around and went back to his house and didn't talk about it. The next day, my friend who owned the property asked if we had seen anything weird out there. He sort of had a funny look at his eyes. And when I told him about it, he said that he too had seen something like that a few times in the woods behind his house, but never wanted to mention it to us because he said he didn't want to look crazy. He also said that one time he was driving down a gravel road on his property at night and saw lights flashing around him, but he couldn't see what was causing them that time. So after all of that, we would see strange things from time to time, but nothing else as crazy as those first two incidents. Oh yeah, and one last thing. My friend who owns the property has been having really strange electrical issues with his house for a while now. Lights would go on and off by themselves. Appliances would turn on when they weren't plugged in, etc., etc. He thought it was just faulty wiring or something like that until he started having issues with his phone, too. His phone would ring, but then there wouldn't be anybody on the other line. Then the call would hang up without him even disconnecting. I'm not sure if this is related to what we saw, but those incidents happened about the same time as everything else that we saw and heard. So I'm guessing there's a connection. Thanks for being willing to hear my story because my friends are honestly sick of it. My fiancé and I took one of our bucket list vacations last winter near the Canadian border so that we could visit Niagara Falls. We were staying in a small log cabin, part of a campground, and planned on skiing and playing around for the weekend. Unfortunately, that isn't exactly how things worked out. 
Initially, everything was great. We got there early, moved in, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. In fact, me and my partner were having an excellent time. That is, until nightfall. We were outside grilling, figuring out how to keep a fire lit. Neither one of us are exactly camping experts. And then we began to notice something awry. At first, all we could focus on was the smell. The horrendous, inhuman stench of pure rot. It was foul. Worse than a skunk. Worse than finding a dead mouse in your basement. Just putrid. It seemed like it was far enough away at that point. Just sort of wafting but that definitely doesn't mean it wasn't unnoticeable. Immediately, I wanted to go inside. I'm somewhat of a scaredy cat myself, and frankly, I had no interest in finding out more. My fiancé, on the other hand, is much braver than I, annoyingly so, and wanted to see what was the matter. They insisted that it might be a hurt animal, or if not, just something interesting to look at. Luckily, at this point, I talked her into waiting until the morning to investigate anything. After we finally managed to get the fire lit and have a few roasted marshmallows, we talked about heading in for the evening. Moments later, just as we put out the fire, we began to hear the oddest, most artificial cry for help. Help me! I don't know how to describe it, really, but I'll never forget how the voice made me feel. Unsettled? Off? It was unnatural. Like it was clear someone or something was mimicking the yell. Now I've seen far too many horror films to go wandering into the forest looking for a mysterious wounded person. But my fiancé? She wanted to see what was going on. And I wasn't going to let her go alone. So we agreed to only walk as far as we could while still seeing the cabin. So that we would still be lit up by the general property. I wasn't going to go anywhere too dark, and luckily my partner at least agreed that once I got a bad feeling and ran off with my tail between my legs, she would join me. So there we went, towards the direction of the ominous yelling and evidently the same direction as the foul odor that seemed to grow more and more repulsive by the minute. This just convinced her that whoever it was, yelling for help like that, was injured in some gruesome way. Also, I don't want to sound like some uppity homebody who just isn't used to the smells of the great outdoors. I've been camping in my life more times than I can count, not to mention hunting and fishing, and I promise you this smell wasn't the smell of any dead animal I have ever experienced. My nostrils practically burned in reaction to that rot, and the closer we approached, the more eager I was to get the hell back to the cabin. I just knew, instinctively, Something was wrong. But onward we went, and as the sound grew closer, the more distorted it became. I would not have been surprised at that point if it was a recording or something. But that's just the thing. Once we got close enough to make out the shadow of a figure, the stature of the silhouette was terrifyingly large in comparison to the voice that it was simulating. It was tall, too tall to be a person, or frankly anything else I've ever seen. I have to admit, we didn't get a good look at the thing. We made out the shape of it from about 15 feet back, something like that. I then grabbed her, and I absolutely booked it. Now I could be wrong. In fact, really, I hope that I am. Because by the looks of it, that thing, whatever it was, was about 8 feet tall, with antlers. Unless a giant elk figured out how to stand on its hind legs, I really doubt that what we saw was any kind of an actual animal. Naturally, we decided it would be best to cut the trip pretty short. We figured that instead of staying the full week, we would only stay for the rest of the weekend, and then find a hotel somewhere. Now, here's the oddest part. The very next day, we go down to the main office building of the campground just to tell them about what we saw and everything. The guy looked uninterested as hell, until I said the word antlers. After that, as I talked about the nasty smell, you could see the guy practically get white as a sheet. And it didn't help calm my nerves, because as soon as we were done talking, the guy offers us half of our deposit back. Odd, yeah. And I've never even heard of someone getting offered money for spotting an animal on the property of a campground. I will admit, the following night, our last night, in a lot of ways, it was normal. 
Except, of course, for us being scared half to death that we were going to have our door smashed in by some strange creature. Moral of the story is we are never heading back to that campground. Hell, never that part of the country, if we can help it. Who knows what could have happened if we actually approached that thing. So just be careful when you're up in the east and watch out for that stench. Nothing good will come of it. I can tell you that. My best friend lives five minutes away from me. It's super easy to get to their house, just two back roads and a left turn. But I'll admit, the second of the two roads is lined with trees and can be a little creepy to drive at night. Regardless of this, I always drove the back roads. Driving the opposite direction took significantly longer, and I'm 24 years old. At this age, I really have no excuse to avoid a road solely because it's in the woods and feels creepy. Well, that was until last night. It's hard to put the encounter into words without sounding crazy, even though I've always found cryptids fascinating. I thought creatures like this were just for fun, stories to tell around a bonfire. And not only that, but I live in Delaware. I mean, nothing out of the ordinary ever happens here. I'm making a left onto this back road, and I remember thinking it was eerily dark. I look up at the sky, and it must have been a new moon or something because it was bare, not even a star to look at. Not to mention, the most putrid smell was in the air. I thought for sure somebody must have hit a skunk or the old creek had overflowed. After a few seconds of driving, I flash on my high beams because I can hardly see, and that's when I saw it. I slammed on my brakes, my breath caught in my throat. It was like, for a minute, everything stopped. It must have been every bit of eight feet tall, reared up on its back legs in the middle of the road. I guess in situations like that, your brain does everything possible to explain away what you're seeing. As much as I would have been relieved to say this thing was a malnourished horse, it wasn't. While its face did look like a horse, it had these horns protruding out of its head wrapping backwards, almost like you'd expect to see on a goat. And while I can't be certain, it looked as though its skin was scaly, not furry, because of the way it clung to the bones underneath. Despite how skeletal this thing was, my brain was racing, seeking any explanation possible as to what it could be. And that's when its wings jutted out. They were bony, tattered, ripped in several places from what I could see. I obviously knew there was no way a bat could be this big, but perhaps the scientists were wrong, and pterodactyls weren't extinct. Like I said, my mind was trying to explain this away any way it possibly could. I wasn't sure the thing would be able to fly with how beat up it looked, but I was not sticking around to find out. It felt like an eternity had passed since turning down this road, but I know in actuality it must have been 10 seconds max. Yes, it was as though my body had forgotten how to work a car. I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to shift into reverse. And as the danger I'm in starts to settle over me, I panic. My palms are now sweaty. I'm breathing heavily and desperately trying to get the car out of drive. I likely fumbled around for only five seconds, but in this situation, that was far too long. I look up and the creature slowly rotates its face to face my car and its piercing yellow eyes lock with mine. Screw the reverse. I knew if I wanted to live this time, it was now or never. I slammed my foot on the gas, and I thank God every day that there was this small clearance on the side of the road before the trees began. My car lurched off the cement onto the grass, and I completed the fastest U-turn imaginable. When I'm finally facing the opposite direction, I launch my car back up onto the road, I'm thinking to myself, if I stay in the dirt, my tires might spin, and that is time I cannot afford to waste. Since having turned the car around, the road in my rear view fell pitch black once again, besides two glowing dots. I knew they were the creature's eyes, still looking in my direction, and what's worse, they started moving. To say I'm lucky that nothing or nobody was in front of me while driving is an understatement. I wouldn't have seen them if there was, because my eyes were glued to the rearview mirror. At first, the eyes seemed to bounce up and down, a movement that told me the thing must have been galloping towards me. 
Despite my anguish realizing this, my foot did not waver. A quick glance at the speedometer told me I was already at 95 miles an hour, and I had no intentions of easing up. Suddenly, the eyes stopped moving up and down, and instead they shot straight up into the air, out of sight of my rearview mirror. The pit in my stomach became astronomically bigger as it dawned on me that this thing was now in the air. As much as I was terrified to exit the safety of the car, I knew that at that point the most logical decision was to get home and back to my house. At the very least, my parents would be there, and I wouldn't be facing this thing alone. As you can imagine, I got home in record speed, and I didn't even pause to think when I threw my car in park and ran inside without even turning it off. I made so much commotion my parents were at my side in an instant, and I sobbed endlessly before being able to recount the night's events. It's now been four months since that happened, and I see a therapist three times a week to manage my fear of leaving the house. I'm doing my best to implement the best practices I'm given, but one thing is for certain, even when I work up the courage to drive on my own, I know I will never be driving that back road again. Before I really get into my story, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory and info on me. I'm a 33-year-old software developer. I moved here to Mississippi to help with a software company, but originally I'm from California. I pride myself on being a good Christian man, and I love the Lord. He's blessed me with a beautiful wife and three boys. They're all my pride and joy, and because of this, I firmly believe in hard work and good traditional living, doing good works, and being a good person. So one day I decided to take my sons out shooting with my brother and his two boys. All the boys are aged between 9 and 14, so you can imagine it was quite boisterous and lots of energy. It was a good day out until something happened. I believe there's evil in this world, and what we encountered that day was something not of this world. It was sinister, diabolical, completely from the pits of hell, something that even my prayers wouldn't keep us from, which is, for me, saying a lot. So let me get into the story. So we were walking through the woods, I had my rifle in hand, the kids were running around, and my brother and myself, we were telling them to be quiet, listening to all of the sounds, trying to be quiet and observe. They eventually did settle down, but they were goofing around, and I kept rolling my eyes, hoping they would learn something from watching us two older guys. My boots were crunching against the forest floor, and I raised my rifle for any hint of movement, or possibly a boar that we could shoot. As the day progressed, one of my boys spotted a deer in the distance, a beautiful white-tailed deer that seemed to dance before us. It hopped and it skipped a little in the maze of trees, and we pursued it, not to kill it. We didn't have any tags for it, but we just wanted to see where it would go. But then we stopped, suddenly and abruptly. The deer that we were chasing, we found lying dead on the ground. I was going to use this opportunity to teach my sons about tracks, but this deer was already dead. Its abdomen tore open and its innards pouring out, giving blood all around. It was a mess, a mess that you would see in a horror movie. My youngest son screamed and hid behind my leg. Normally I might have called him out for being scared, but I felt like I was screaming inside too. Feasting on this deer, we saw this large creature that resembled a wolf, easily the size of a bear. In fact, I even thought it was a bear at first until it stood up, and it towered over me, and I'm six foot two. This thing was double my width, full of rippling muscles, kind of like a gorilla, but bigger, vast in all of its proportions. Its hands even reminded me, and its body even reminded me of a gorilla, but the head was all wrong, and it had a head like a dog. I can't really describe it to you, what it looked like, but maybe a jackal, if I had to guess. But it was black, with thick, dark fur. 
I tried to erase the memory from my head, but the face of this thing was so fierce, so evil, that this wasn't normal. There were no normal animals in the woods that stand on two legs that look anything like this. It had two protruding canines out of its sunken mouth. After maybe not even more than a minute passed, this thing turned to look at us, as if giving us a signal with its facial expression to not come any closer, to leave it alone. It had a very annoyed expression on its face, and it just looked at us in an intense glare. My kids were crying. Myself and my brother, we were terrified. We slowly backed away as much as we could until it was completely out of view. And there, we very quickly made our way back to our car, hung up all of our equipment, and drove home silently, almost feeling traumatized, broken, and violated. My boys did not need to see that. They have no idea what they even saw, and I was bombarded with questions after questions, worried that this thing would come back home to where we were and our safety and get them. Or worse, follow us home. I had to assure the boys that this was something else. This was something that was not going to come back and get us. But since then, my one son has lost all interest in things, and he now spends his time drawing and crying a lot. I believe that they have some serious trauma issues from this, and trust me, it's been really tough to even get any kind of a therapy for them. I too have bouts of anxiety and panic attacks for the first time that I've ever had in my life. It's the not knowing what we saw that is the most troublesome. I almost wonder if I will ever feel okay. I know that the past years have been tough, but this experience alone has been far worse than any virus. I still see this creature, its face, ripping open that deer, and it makes me break down sometimes. I haven't really explained this to my wife because what do I even tell her? I don't even know what's wrong with me. I don't have the words. I feel like this experience has changed me, like I'm marked, whatever that means. And if you have encountered this creature yourself, I would love to hear your experience and to share my experiences with you. Thank you. I remember it was a muggy August day in the mid-80s. I think it was around 1986. My mom and I were driving from our home in Rochester, Indiana to Muskegon, Michigan to visit my grandmother for a few days. I was around 17 years old at the time, and I remember that I had just gotten my license. So even though the trip would take about three hours, it was a good trip for me to get some experience. We had been on the road for more than an hour when we approached a set of railroad tracks that crossed over a two-lane highway. I believe at that point we were on Highway 31, but I'm not 100% sure. As we got closer to the crossing, I noticed something large and dark moving along the tree line on the far side of the tracks. It was weird because it seemed to be following parallel with us as we drove north, basically moving along with us but ahead of us and within the trees. Now, my mom is a very observant person, especially when it comes to animals. She's always been able to identify any type of animal she saw by its movements alone, which made her more than qualified in my eyes as someone who could identify what this thing could be. She noticed it instantly without me even saying anything. And as we approached the tracks, she asked me to slow down so that she could get a better look at it. As I slowed the car down, my mom turned in her seat and leaned way out of the passenger window to get a better view of whatever it was. As she did this, I watched from my vantage point in the driver's seat as something large and dark sprinted from behind a tree across the railroad tracks and into another patch of trees on the other side. It covered quite a bit of ground in just a few seconds, which made me wonder exactly how big this thing was. Like, how long were its legs that it was able to do that? And why did it reveal itself to us, if even for that split second? My mom sat back up in her seat after it disappeared into the tree line on the other side. I have no idea what that was, she said, but it sure looked like a bear. 
I mean, it was furry and huge, but looked way bigger than a bear to me. I did agree with her somewhat, but I was also thinking it may have been some kind of a wolf or a large dog. I felt that it was definitely a large animal, but much larger than any dog I've ever seen. It had dark fur and appeared to be very muscular based on the way its body moved as it sprinted across the railroad tracks. To be honest, its movement was similar to that of a cheetah's in that it covered ground quickly. But the insane part was that it had been running on two legs. I think that's the part that really had us wondering what was going on. My mom and I just looked at each other for a few minutes after it disappeared, not really knowing what to say. We were both in shock at what we had just seen, and our brains were trying to process what it could have been. After a few moments, my mom said she wanted to go back and retrace our last 500 feet of the drive or so, just to take another look and be sure that there wasn't just something out there that had messed with our brains, like a dead tree or brush blowing around. I was hesitant, and I knew in my heart that there was no real logical explanation for this. It felt real, but not real at the same time, which was equally terrifying. And I didn't want to get too close to whatever that thing was. But my mom was insistent, so I turned the car around and slowly drove back. When we got there, we instead stopped the car and got out to take a closer look. I was not okay with this. But there was no sign of the animal anywhere. No footprints, no fur, nothing. It was as if it had just vanished. And that's when we heard a noise that I will never forget. It sounded like a woman screaming, coming from the direction of where we had seen the animal last, where it disappeared into the trees. We both just looked at each other for a few minutes, not knowing what to do. And then my mom said, now it's time to go. So we got back in the car and drove off as fast as we could. I basically gunned it past the spot where we had last seen it, hoping and praying that it wouldn't show itself again. Luckily, all went well. We got past that intersection of trees safely, and we were able to continue on to my grandma's. We didn't say much to each other after that. I think we were both still in shock from what we had seen and heard, thinking in our own minds about what just happened. We mentioned it to my grandmother, but she didn't seem to take us too seriously. I mean, she was kind, but basically moved on to another subject rather quickly. So that sort of woke us up, and we never really talked about it again after that day. And to this day, I still have no idea what we saw. I do know one thing for sure, it was not a bear or a dog, at least not the kind that we know of. This next story takes place in 1975. I grew up on a farm in Tennessee surrounded by dense trees and vegetation. When I was little, we played outside on the farm and in the trees, but that all changed in the fall of 75. We were surrounded by cornfields getting ready for harvest. Corn stood six to seven feet tall and you could literally get lost in it. We sometimes did when playing hide-and-seek with my cousins. My sister and I had horses, and we loved to go riding. We would explore the woods and the cornfields. That day, we took the horses down a farm road around this grove of trees and got ready to race once we hit the corner. My sister was only around 10 years old, so I kept a good eye on her, but she could handle horses well. We got two posts away from the corner, and the horses cut loose. But as we went to turn, they stopped dead mid-lope and suddenly reared up, knocking us both off. I still hung on to the reins and quickly got up to help my sister. She grabbed her horse. It was backing away, throwing its head. Mine was acting the same way. I struggled to get my sister up on her horse and keeping control of mine as it turned in circles. As I turned in circles trying to calm the horse, I saw it. All I said was, get on your horse and threw my sister onto her saddle. She started crying, terrified. I let her horse go so it shot back to the farm like a racehorse at the gate. Luckily, she was able to hold on and made it back to the barn safely. I struggled to get on mine as I couldn't take my eyes off the thing at the edge of the woods. 
It was huge and hid behind a cedar. I couldn't really see its eyes, but I know it was watching me. I finally got on my horse, absolutely terrified. I let my horse go, and she shot off towards home. Dad was already coming out of the house as my sister was screaming, There's something in the woods! There's something in the woods! I wasn't faring much better, crying in terror. We were kids and freaking out as kids do. My sister was clinging to my dad. The horses were worked up and still wide-eyed and trying to get away. Dad told us to get them in the barn until they calmed. We ran back as Dad came out with a shotgun and said, Show me where it's at. Being kids and under the impression that my dad was invincible, we did as we were told. It was terrifying, though, the thought of going back. So my little sister stayed with my mom. Dad drove the truck to where we saw it. My brother came, too. But of course it was gone. Nothing. Dad and my brother went and investigated behind the tree, looking down and then towards the field. My dad stood six foot two and the tree ten feet, and that damn thing had to be at least eight or nine feet. They finally came back and told me it was my imagination, but I swear to God it was there and it was real. The next day, a couple of neighbor kids and I, armed with a shovel and an axe, searched those trees for the thing that had terrified us. We went to that tree. The heavy leaf cover was all messed up and I saw scratches on the tree. Dad later said it was just them scratching there and I didn't argue. My dad was never a liar, ever. He passed away in 2018 and sometime after he died, my mom told my sister and I a story we couldn't believe. After we had seen whatever that creature was, a few weeks later my dad came home from playing cards with friends and neighbors in town. He parked in the garage, which wasn't connected to the house. As he was walking across the yard and he heard something he's never heard. It was low, growling sounds that were getting closer and closer. It stopped him dead in his tracks. As he looked around, he felt like it was mocking him making the sounds, but he couldn't tell what direction they were coming from. He told my mom he felt a darkness and fear like he had never felt before. He didn't want to scare us any more than we already were, but my dad was scared, and he told my mom, don't let the kids go in the woods. He kept the shotgun out that night and never usually did that. We weren't allowed into the woods, which was hard to do because the farm was surrounded by them. I do remember one night that fall, the horses were crying and running in the horse pen. Dad went out with the shotgun, but I don't know what happened. My sister and I never did race the horses there ever again. There was something there. I swear on that. Thanks for listening. I've never told this story to anyone. I was scared to tell anybody until now. I live in southern Michigan, just south of Kalamazoo, and I want to share with you something that happened to me when I was in the woods behind my house collecting firewood. Oh, and this happened about seven years ago, by the way. It was in the early evening, and I was walking down a hill towards the creek when I heard something large moving in the woods to my left. It made a loud, crashing sound as it moved through the underbrush, and it sounded like it was headed straight for me. But despite the noise, I couldn't see anything at all. I stopped and stood still and listened intently, wondering what could be making such a commotion. The sounds stopped abruptly, too, right when I did. But then they started up again. But they were on my right this time and now heading away from me until I couldn't hear it anymore. And then after that, I became very aware of all the noises, all the noises around me, and I kept glancing around nervously while continuing to gather wood. Suddenly, they seemed to be coming at me from all directions. And then a few minutes later, I heard twigs snapping off to my left again, but further away than before. There were several loud snaps, followed by silence, and then more noises further away still. I was beginning to get nervous that something was honing in on me. After about 10 minutes of all of this, the noises stopped completely and didn't resume for the rest of my time in the woods. So I went back to my house and I asked my neighbor if he had ever heard anything unusual in the woods behind our houses, and he admitted that he had heard weird sounds before, but that he never saw whatever made them, and he felt uneasy when it happened to him too. 
so it was exactly the same story as what had just happened to me. Neither of us had a good concrete answer for it. I've never heard anything like it before or since. My best guess is that it was a bear, but I'm still trying to figure that out. I mean, bears usually just keep moving in the same direction unless they're following something, like prey, or being chased away from a food source. I don't know of any other animal that makes that kind of a big noise, and whatever made those noises was much too large to be a deer or any other typical local wildlife. I mean, I've been back to those woods many times since then, and I've never experienced anything like it again. Believe me, I was looking and listening for it. Maybe whatever it was must have been moving around on its own rather than tracking me specifically, which does relieve some of my anxiety. But why did it sound like it started heading towards me one minute and then away from me the next? And what made all those loud snapping noises? It sounded like two pieces of wood being forcefully broken apart, one at a time big ones too, and there were several distinct cracks each time. Anyway, there's just no answer. So since then, I've read a lot of the stories on your site and other sites, and I have some similarities to other encounters, but mostly mine was just very strange and weird and unique with nothing actually visual to even report. So still... I decided to finally report it here because I was just reading online about a man who found a dead dog-like creature in Wisconsin called the Beast of Bray. And for whatever reason, that story prompted me to write in to you. I don't know why. And oh yeah, back when all this happened to me, the one thing that stood out the most, I think, was how loud the noise was. Even though it was coming from what seemed like far away. It was like something really strong and really powerful was making it. That's what I can't get over. My friends and I weren't planning on doing any hiking. We just wanted to get out and enjoy nature and get away from where anyone could bother us. It was August and the weekend before college started back up again, so a lot of our friends were busy or already gone. Anyway, we were just driving around, hanging out, and decided to go for a short hike in Meeman Shelby Forest near where we lived in Tennessee. We figured it would just be fun to wander in the woods, so we parked our car on a small gravel lot, found a trailhead, and headed off. We had no real destination, we were just wandering for the fun of it. So after wandering a bit, we came to this open clearing and decided that we wanted to hang out there, at least for a bit. We weren't hikers after all, and we didn't even have proper shoes on or anything. Jennifer even had on flip-flops. So we plopped ourselves down on some downed trees and just sat there laughing and talking. Honestly, we had no sense of time at that point, and before we knew it, the sun started setting. I don't even think any of us noticed it was happening at first, but once the darkness really started to set in, we all snapped to it a bit, and we realized we're in the woods without flashlights, and we could now barely see 10 feet in front of us. So after trying to make ourselves feel okay by laughing about how ridiculous this was and how stupid we had been, Jennifer pulled out her phone out of her pocket and turned on the flashlight. After some fidgeting, she gets it to work and turns around, shining the light directly in all of our faces. We winced, blinking as she did it. It went into all of our eyes. You idiots, just turn on your flashlights on your phones. She was acting like she was the only one who knew how to do anything. But the next sound out of her mouth was a loud shriek as her phone stopped shining on us and illuminated the area next to us. We all turned in the direction of the light, and that's when we saw it. It was just behind the first tree, off to our left. It was huge and had sort of dog-like features, but human-like in shape. It had long arms with basically human hands, although they were covered completely in fur. And speaking of fur, the fur glistened like it was wet or something. But I'm not totally sure about that. I mean, I could have been confused because of how dark it was at this point. But despite the darkness, and for some reason, I do remember realizing for an absolute fact that it had eyes that literally glowed in the dark. Amber-colored eyes that had an intelligence to them. Like when you look into the eyes of an ape and you feel like you're looking at a human. 
It was that kind of a feeling. The creature stood rooted, staring at us for a long time, just watching, probably to see what we would do. And then without warning, it let out this blood-curdling scream before taking a slow step towards us. The thing's head was scraping against the branches above it, which just didn't seem possible to me. They were really high up there. And that scream surely echoed far through the woods. I also remember thinking I could only hope that somebody else heard it and that they were maybe even calling the police. None of us moved, despite the fact that it was coming right at us. And then Jennifer screamed again, and it shook us out of our trances. Then we all ran as fast as we could back towards our original direction. We were stumbling over each other, not being able to see properly and not having good trail shoes. It's honestly a wonder I'm even still alive to tell you about this. Anyway, we kept fumbling and didn't stop running until we came to a crossroads in the trail, and I had no idea which way to go from there. We were all just running on adrenaline at this point and not thinking at all just reacting and yelling at each other. I was the furthest behind in the group, and just as I could see them all pausing at the crossroads, I heard a branch snap behind me. I screamed, which made them react. Then they all scattered. All three of them went running in different directions. I don't know if they were consciously thinking to split up for safety or something, but at that point, I'm also not really sure if any of us knew what to do besides get away. I took a deep breath, trying to decide which group to follow, and that's when I heard the thing scream again, so loudly that it sounded like it was right on top of me. I swung back my head and realized it had been pretty much on top of me the whole time, but only made the sound just then. It glared back at me and hissed and growled and stomped its feet. Thank God I had enough wits about me to start running again. I'm not sure how far I ran or how long, but I do know that the thing kept up with me hissing and growling the entire time. It seemed like it took forever for it to stop, and I honestly don't remember exactly when it did. At one point, it was just no longer there. Obviously, it could have caught me at any time, I know that, so I have no idea why it didn't. Did it just lose interest? Was it toying with me, or just scaring us all to the point of leaving? I wandered around for a long time after that and eventually found my friends. I had wandered quietly because I was too afraid to call out for them. Jennifer started sobbing as soon as she saw me and said she was scared to death that I had been the creature's next meal. I told her I couldn't imagine what she had been through either. The whole thing was just so surreal. We all had definitely just had the scariest experience of our lives. After a while, we all calmed down, made it back to the car. We talked about it and agreed not to talk about it for a while. After all, we all thought that nobody would have believed us anyway. We all promised that we would say nothing about it and just pretend like it never happened. So we all went back to our homes and our lives and more or less didn't think about it a lot. We still see each other from time to time, but we don't really discuss what happened. And now that was nearly a year ago and none of us have ever even mentioned hiking or going into the woods again. It's sort of an unsaid thing between us. I keep having nightmares, though, and I really think I'm going to reach out to Jennifer to see how she's feeling. I don't think she'll mind me mentioning it, but for now, I just needed to get it off my chest, and that's why I'm writing to you. When I look back on it, I really don't think the creature was trying to actually catch us. For some reason, I just feel like it was making sounds to frighten us away from something. Like maybe it was protecting its young or keeping us away from a territory. Who knows? The bottom line is that I'm not sure what it's protecting out there, but I am sure that I'm never going to find out. I honestly don't know if I ever want to hike at all, ever again. Over the years, there have been no shortage of strange stories coming out of West Virginia. The state is so full of supernatural tales that it's hard to pick and choose which ones are the most compelling. But there is one story in particular that stands out to me because I've heard it a thousand times. Basically been hearing it all my life, and I was born in 1975. It's sort of like legend here, at least in my family. The story comes from my hometown of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which lies on the Ohio River in northwestern West Virginia, right at the Ohio border. 
The area is known for its many strange encounters. Some of these include sightings of ape-like creatures, Mothman, UFOs, and more. We even have an actual dedicated Mothman museum in our town, which should tell you something about the place. So I'm now going to relay to you the story of two women in our town. It's the story I've heard my whole life and I wanted to share it with you here. The first story involves a woman who was driving down a dark stretch of Route 62, headed out of Point Pleasant at around 2 a.m. one night, when she noticed an unusual animal standing at the edge of the road. It wasn't moving, so she couldn't get a good handle on the exact shape of it. At first, she thought it was a deer, but as she got closer, she realized that it was something much stranger. Its silhouette was sort of that of a human, but it had the head of an animal, meaning the head looked to be hairy and very dark in color. She wasn't sure what to make of it, but it was so strange looking that she felt compelled to stop and take a closer look. She was actually sort of worried that it could be someone who needed help. She stopped and slowly brought her vehicle to a rolling stop just near it. But as she opened the door, and started to get out of her car, the creature began to move towards her, walking with a slow gait. And that's when she realized that it wasn't just standing upright temporarily. It was actually walking towards her on two legs and walking normally, as if that's the way it always walked. She sat there with the door open, but still in the car, watched as it approached her, walking with a very human-like step pattern. She was terrified that it was coming to attack her, and it just kept coming closer and not taking its eyes off of her until it was standing right in front of her car. She was now able to get the full view of it. It was definitely not human or anything like anything she'd ever seen before. It was about seven feet tall, very muscular, with dark fur covering its body, and it had the head of a coyote. So without thinking, Without having any control over it, she started screaming and waving her arms, trying to scare it off. And it worked. The creature stopped, flung its arms around in a crazy kind of a way, and then ran towards the woods. And suddenly, it was gone, disappearing into the darkness. She was so startled by this that she jumped back into her car and sped off as fast as she could. She later told authorities that she wasn't sure what the creature was, but it was something that they definitely needed to be taking seriously. She described it to them as being something like a wolf or a large dog that stood taller than her shoulders and had very long front legs that allowed it to stand upright and walk that way. The police looked at her in a way that she later said made her feel stupid, but she was adamant that she saw what she saw and that it was real. And then, a few weeks later, a second woman had a very similar encounter with the same creature. She too was driving on Route 62 late at night when she noticed something strange standing at the side of the road. She didn't stop. She continued driving by. But as she got closer, she realized that it was some kind of a creature she had never seen before. She described it as very tall, this one standing at least seven feet tall with the head of an animal, but she couldn't tell what kind either, and it too began walking towards her on two legs, but then it suddenly disappeared into the darkness. Now she never did get out of her car or scream, but it was basically the same story occurring in the same area. She then sped away quickly, as fast as she could, but she kept glancing over her shoulder and looking into her rearview mirror to make sure it wasn't following. Once she reached a well-lit area, she stopped and looked back again, but saw nothing. She decided to report the incident to the local police station once morning came around. But when she got there and told her story, she too was met with skepticism by the officers on duty. However, they did take down her information and said that if any similar reports came in, they would contact her. But no follow-up ever occurred for either woman or so that's how the story goes in my town. So I'm not sure what happened after that. I've heard this story many times over the years and I have no idea what this animal really was or why it was there in the first place. Was it some kind of a cryptid? A mutant dog perhaps? 
Or was it something even stranger? I guess we may never know for sure. Have you ever heard of this creature? Or do you live in the area? If you've had a similar encounter, please let us know in the comments below. This encounter takes place in State College, Pennsylvania in October of 2019. Jared and his mom lived together, just the two of them in central Pennsylvania near State College. State College is a college town, home to Penn State University, and it's right in the center of Pennsylvania. The area is surrounded by large tracts of farmland and an expanse of Appalachian mountain ranges and forests. Basically, the surrounding areas are very rural, with acres of untouched land. It was October, and the leaves were falling off the trees, and the town was full of students as classes were in full swing. The air was getting colder, and the days shorter, though, so evenings were starting to get a bit less crowded on the streets than the previous few months. Jared's mom and dad had divorced two years ago, and it seemed like his mom was working all the time, trying to make ends meet. So he found himself home alone a lot, but he knew that it wasn't his mom's fault, and also he helped around the house. He had just turned 17 the previous month and was definitely mature for his age. Today, he had gotten home from school and read the note that his mom had left before she went to work. It said, Hey, sweetie, I hope you had a good day at school. I didn't have time to go grocery shopping today, so can you please just do it for me? Here's the list and some money. Love you. So he did. He went to the grocery store. He got the things on the list, added a six-pack of Coke for himself, and started walking home. It was a short walk, but it was fall and now getting dark out earlier. This particular day was a cloudy day, and Jared had his hoodie up and covered his ears, which meant that he couldn't really see or hear too much as he walked home. He was walking on the path that led from his house to the grocery store, a path through a park that he had taken a million times before. The leaves were crunching under his feet and he could see his breath in the air. He was starving and thinking about the chicken he was going to make for dinner when he sort of heard a noise behind him. It sounded like something large was moving through the woods towards him. He turned around, but he saw nothing, just the trees swaying in the wind. He shrugged it off and turned back around and continued walking, but he did pull his hoodie off of his head. And that's when he heard it again and this time it sounded even closer. He started walking faster, but whatever was making the noise was also walking faster now too. Jared began to run, but before he could get far, whatever was chasing him caught up to him, and he felt something bump into him from behind. He fell forward to the ground, and the groceries broke out from the plastic bags that he was carrying. They scattered all over the path. While still on the ground, Jared turned his body around, only to see a large, wolf-like creature looming over him. It was taller than he was when he was standing at full height, and its fur was a dirty gray color. It had yellow eyes that seemed to almost glow in the darkness, and it was staring down at him with its eyes burning into his. Jared was frozen with fear. His thoughts immediately went to trying to figure out if the creature was going to harm him. But the creature didn't attack him, it just stood there, looking down at him. Jared watched as it breathed heavily, making puffs of air that came out of its mouth and condensed on its nose. After a few minutes, it turned and walked away, disappearing into the woods. Jared lay there for a few moments longer, trying to process what had just happened. He had never seen anything like that before. He didn't know if he should call the police or just get himself home. He decided that he needed to get home right away. So he pulled himself up, left all of the groceries because he now had no way to carry them, and he ran the rest of the way home, not stopping, until he was inside. He instantly locked all the windows and the doors and then called his mom and described to her what had happened. 
she instantly called the police. She wasn't even sure that it had been the creature that Jared described, but it was clear to her that something not right had happened. His voice had made that very clear to her. The police came and talked to Jared and took a report saying they would head over to the park to see what they could find. But in the end, they didn't find anything. And when they went out to look for the creature, nothing was there. The strangest part was that they didn't even find the groceries that Jared said he had dropped and left behind. It was almost as if the entire thing hadn't happened. It crossed Jared's mind that the creature could have picked up the groceries and taken them, but the whole thing was just so bizarre. No surprise, Jared never went back to that park again, and he still thinks about that creature sometimes when he's alone at night. Was it real? Or did he just imagine it? No one else can confirm other than him, and the experience has him so shook up that he's not even sure what to believe anymore. Sequoia National Park is known to have some strange and wonderful creatures. However, there have been stories circulating recently of something else, something that doesn't quite fit into any of the park's ecosystems. In September of 2018, two brothers hiking in the backcountry of Sequoia National Park had an unusual encounter with a creature that shook them to their core. Miguel and his brother Carlos were 21 and 24 when it happened. They had spent the previous days camping and hiking, and they were getting ready to head back home the day they had the encounter. It was early morning, and the sun had just started to peak over the horizon, casting an eerie glow on the area around them. They had gotten up very early that day since they wanted to hike some of the High Sierra Trail. So they headed out, and at one point, Miguel had hiked a bit ahead of Carlos when he heard Carlos shouting behind him. When he ran back to see what was wrong, Carlos was pointing frantically at something in the bushes, a short distance away. Miguel looked over, squinted his eyes, and that's when he saw it too. A large, furry creature was standing there, still and quiet, watching them intently with bright eyes that seemed to be glowing in the morning sun. The creature was much taller than both brothers, and it had a long snout. It was covered in thick fur that was a light brownish color. They stood there, not knowing if this thing would attack them or what it wanted, and they didn't want to move quickly to find out. So in the first few seconds, their brains told them it was a bear. But as they continued to watch it, they realized quickly that it wasn't a bear. Yes, it was covered in thick, light brownish fur, but it didn't take much to realize that this thing was actually unknown to them, an animal that they didn't have a name for. Miguel's hair stood on end and he could feel his heart start to race. Carlos was still trying to convince himself that it was a bear, but that it was just sick or some kind of deformity, which was why it looked different. But Miguel said, definitely not. In those moments, it was impossible for the brothers to decide what they were exactly dealing with. So they came to the conclusion that they would take a video mostly so that they could remember what they were looking at, and also to show it to friends and family to try to figure it out. And then right as Carlos was slowly moving his hand toward his pocket to get out his phone, the creature made this loud screeching noise, jumped over the bushes it was next to, and ran off into the woods. Carlos was able to grab his phone and click a quick photo, but it turned out to be a complete blur, because he jumped when the screeching noise happened. The brothers then decided to walk over to the spot where the creature had been standing, and there, on the ground, they found unusual footprints that were wide and long, with five toes, but still basically the shape of a human foot. Miguel then took a picture of the footprints with his phone before they both determined that they had better make their way back to camp. They were a few miles away. It could take them an hour or so to get there. The return trip was the most anxious part because they both kept thinking about what they had seen and feeling like it was everywhere around them, wondering if it would show itself again. They would both later say that the entire way back they couldn't help but feel as if they were being watched. So when they got back to camp, they sat down and talked about what had happened, comparing each of their memories on the colors, the height, etc. Some of their details were different, but both were in agreement that it was something crazy. 
something so unique that they felt it was some kind of undiscovered animal. But what kind? And why was it in Sequoia National Park? And then, right as they were deciding what to do next, a car pulled up to their campsite. They both jumped. They were on edge. They became very anxious. Who could this be, they thought. But right away then they recognized the emblem on the side of the vehicle as the park logo, and the vehicle had a park ranger inside. The ranger got out and introduced himself, and then after a bit of small talk, asked if they had seen anything unusual during their time in the park. He said he was just checking in with various visitors in their area. They looked at each other, wondering how he could have known. The coincidence was too uncanny that they figured he knew more than he was telling. So when they told him about the creature, he asked them to describe it in detail. And then he asked them to repeat the description three or four times. Next, the ranger shared with them that he had been getting reports of something similar from other campers for the past few weeks. He said there had been a total of seven reports so far, all from different areas of the park, not just in their area. But no one had been able to present a good picture or video of the creature. The ranger thanked them for their help and told them that he would be in touch. He also told them not to worry and that he would look into it and try to figure out what was going on. But something about his words did not sit well with the brothers. They both agreed that the park ranger seemed a bit strange, and they also both felt as if he was keeping most of the information from them. So as the ranger drove away, the brothers looked at each other with this sense of wonder and awe. They had just had the most unbelievable camping experience of their lives, and they were now part of something much bigger than they could have ever imagined. But they also knew that they would likely never know the full extent. So as was their original plan, they packed up their things that day and headed home. They vowed to watch the internet and social media for any news or updates on what was happening at the park, and if anybody else posted anything about seeing things that were strange. They did continue to keep their eyes out for any online posts, but eventually, with nothing much being posted, they eventually lost interest in checking. And so, the mystery remains. What exactly did they see that day in Sequoia National Park? Was it some kind of undiscovered animal or creature? Or was it something else entirely? We may never know for sure, but one thing is certain. There is definitely something strange going on in the park. Do you believe them? What do you think the creature was? I grew up in a small town in Vermont. Actually, small town doesn't even begin to describe the desolation of the place. We had just under 600 people living there. It was so small that all the kids went to a consolidated high school half an hour north of our town. We shared the school with two other districts, ours being the smallest of the bunch. My crush wasn't from my town. He didn't even know my name, but I knew his. He was the classic, unreachable type, jock on the honor roll and a place in student council. He was always smiling and surrounded by friends. So one day at lunch, when I was a junior, one of my friends dared me to go over to his table and ask him out. I wasn't going to at first, but then I realized that it didn't really matter if it went badly. He'd probably forget I existed by the end of the day. And besides, it seemed exactly like the type of thing he would do if he were in my position. Like, just easily be social. So I started walking towards his lunch table, yet still mentally cursing the friend who put me up to it. And I instantly started getting looks from the other people at his table. When I finally got there, he looked up at me, and his smile eased my nerves a little. I introduced myself and asked him out, all in one gesture. I was awkward as hell, but trying to play it off cool. There was a party that night, he had said, and he would love it if I stopped by. I couldn't believe it. I was beaming inside. My friends couldn't believe it either, but like they really didn't believe it. They started getting all in my head and telling me that it was a prank or something like there was no way somebody like him would want anything to do with me. I was pretty upset about this for the rest of the day. My friends were jerks, and there was no way I wanted them killing my excitement, so I ducked out of school as soon as I heard the final bell. When I got home, the phone rang a few times, but I let all the calls go to the machine. I was sure it was just them trying to get a last-minute invite to the coolest party of the year, 
no chance. So I hopped in my car at about 7.45. The party started at 8, he said, and it was way over in the deepest part of their town. It was going to take at least 45 minutes for me to get there, so I figured I would just be fashionably late. My town was especially quiet that night. Some of the lights were on inside the pharmacy and the police station, but I didn't see any pedestrians on my way out. I don't even think a car passed. Sure, it was a small town, but this was off. I saw that my gas was getting low, so I pulled into the gas station before I left the town limits. The attendant was nowhere to be found, so I filled my tank myself and headed out. The back roads of this particular part of Vermont are eerie. Eerie to say the least. They always have been. Driving them alone at night is its own sort of isolation. And that night, the town was empty, and I was literally the only one on the road. But I just knew I wasn't alone. I randomly kept getting these goosebumps all over my body like somebody had dropped an ice cube down the back of my shirt. Fear rushed over me for a second at one point, before I came to. It was dark as hell out there, too, and I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to pass out. If I'd gotten into an accident, who knows when somebody would have found me. So I pulled off the road into a small dirt clearing on the outskirts of the woods. I put the car in park and I kept the engine on, gripping the wheel tightly, trying to slow my heart rate. I needed air. So I got out of the car and I put my hands on my knees. I was starting to feel normal, but then I stood up and I arched my back in a stretch, and when I looked up at the sky, I gasped. I saw a dark mass above me, like directly above me, floating about twenty feet in the air. The night was incredibly dark, and the object blended almost seamlessly into the sky. The headlights of my car were just barely reflecting some of their glow onto the shiny black thing. My mouth went dry, and I stood there for a few moments as if I was made of stone. I was in shock. This thing was floating in mid-air. Something whirred from the flying thing, something mechanical. And this was enough to wake me up, and I literally jumped back into my car. I poked my head out the window, and I looked up at the sky. The thing had now repositioned itself ever so slightly so that it hovered directly above my car. I stared at it for a long time, like I was in a trance. And then that cold ice cube feeling came back, but this time, I knew I had to get the hell out of there. I put the car in reverse and I kicked up dust as I sped away. I didn't even know what I was running from. If my thoughts were correct, the thing would be flying over me, following my every move. I forgot totally about my crush. I started speeding back to town. And I was speeding. I was only 15 minutes out from the edge of town when I checked my tank. It was nearly empty. Before I could make excuses, I knew that the floating thing above me was responsible it wanted me uncovered and defenseless out there in the pitch black. The ice cube feeling came back, and then I felt my car start to rattle as I crossed the town line. The gas was almost gone, but at least now there were street lights. Amazingly, I made it to the gas station. My car stopped. I had been cursing and sweating my ass off for the past 20 minutes, but I wasn't going to get out of that car. No way. I woke up the next morning to the attendant tapping my windshield with a genuinely confused expression. I hesitantly stepped out of the car and looked up. Just a blue sky. Nothing more. No floating object. I had the attendant fill my tank and I headed home. Whatever had happened to me that night, it was inexplicable. But I was just happy to be alive. Interestingly, I didn't feel like a loser anymore either. Somehow, surviving that ordeal all alone, made me stand taller and feel more confident. Obviously, I never made it to the party, but that never bothered me. I literally felt like a whole new person after that. Thanks for listening. I had always hated the woods. To be honest, if it hadn't been for me having the dogs with me, there is no way I would have been anywhere near them that time of night. I used to have to walk through the woods on my way back from college in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But they creeped me out so much that eventually I started getting off the bus one stop later, and walking back the long way around. I mean, at least there were streetlights then. On those paths in the woods, you could hardly see where you were going half of the time. Or who was there with you. Anything could happen. Anyway, the only reason I started going back into the woods was a job. 
I had been at college for about two semesters, and I was really starting to run low on cash. I had a job the previous summer, but it ended at the start of school, so I hadn't worked since then. I asked around with my friends to see if there was anything going on, and one of them suggested dog walking. Now I know it sounds crazy, but honestly, I loved it most of the time. I've always liked animals, and except for one or two that get a bit boisterous now and again, the dogs in our neighborhood are pretty good. At least the ones I had to work with. Basically, the job is what it sounds like. At a certain time every day, you show up at a house of somebody who isn't home or can't take their dogs out as often as they like. You collect the dogs and their leashes, and then you just take a whole bunch of them out for a walk to make sure they get some exercise. Anyway, you can't let the dogs off the leash in busy areas because, you know, one might run out in the road or whatever. They could get hit by a car. The real trick, though, is to find a piece of an open area or woods where you can let them off the leash to have a proper run. And that's why I started going back into the woods again. This gave the dogs some space to run around, and I figured nothing much was going to happen to me. If I had six dogs with me, I mean, what could happen? Until that night, I actually didn't feel scared at all going in there, so long as the dogs were with me. But now, well... I'll never go in there again. So that night I go into the woods and I let the dogs off their leashes. Most times they stay fairly close and they kind of play and jump all over each other and just sniff around like dogs do. But this day, something changed. It's weird because you would think that only loud noises and sounds would make you pay attention. You know, like if a balloon breaks or a car backfires or whatever. But the same thing happens when sounds stop. When things get quiet, you notice. Like when the sound should have been there, and then it stops, or it goes away, you suddenly get really hyper-aware. And that's what happened to me. The dogs had run off a bit ahead, but after a minute or two, I couldn't hear them anymore. And that was weird. Anybody who has dogs will tell you they are not quiet animals. Especially when there's a few of them together, they're always barking or yipping at each other or whatever but suddenly it was like they just fell off the face of the planet. Suddenly, they all went silent. By this point, I was starting to get scared, so I walked a bit more cautiously. And then as I turned the corner, I saw all of them together, lying on the ground in the middle of the path, all on their backs, silent, with their bellies exposed. Now when they do that, it isn't just because they want to belly rub. It's a submissive thing like the weaker dogs do it in front of the leaders of the pack, or the alpha male. It's the same thing with wolves. To start with, I wondered what in the hell they were doing, but then, well, I saw it. It wasn't a dog, and it wasn't a man. It was some kind of an other thing. A thing that you shouldn't be. That you know like it shouldn't exist or even be allowed to exist. Like it was made wrong. In a weird way, it looked stretched as if it had been pulled or wrenched too hard when it was formed. For a full minute or so, I stood stock still, frozen to the spot, my legs just refusing to work. I just stood there, and I watched. It had appeared out of the clearing from the trees on one side of the path, and it moved in these long strides, like a man. It stood up on two legs like a man, but those legs weren't like a man's at all. They had that funny backward arch at the joint, like a dog's legs, or the hind legs of a horse. You could see, in the way that the muscles moved beneath the fur, that it wasn't built like a dog either. It looked unbelievably strong, too. It had these muscles, like knots of cable, like you could tell that with just one snap, all that energy could be released, and that it could just rip or tear apart whatever it wanted. I took all of this in, scared to stay, scared to move, just unsure of what to do, until it looked at me. More than anything, I remember. I remember its head. It was massive, like a dog's head with ears that jutted upwards in sharp angles, but huge, muscular. The size and the power of its shape reminded me more of a big predator, like a lion or a leopard, like the whole thing was just built to hunt. As it turned towards me, I saw its eyes, and they were yellow and they fixed on me like it was assessing me or sizing me up. 
I saw more intelligence in those eyes than you see in my dog. And there was also like a malice, you know, like it knew it was looking at me. It knew that I had seen it, and it knew that I couldn't outrun it. I saw its head sink down, and then all of a sudden I heard the dogs bark, all of them at once, louder and closer. I looked from those eyes to the teeth below, hanging like stalactites, jagged and jutting forwards, and I ran. I sprinted towards the open roads with the dogs following after me, dragging their leashes behind them. We were all pushing with everything we had to get back to the road, to the light, to safety, and to people, knowing all the while, just as it knew, that if it chased me, if it chose to come after me, to see me as prey, that I was done. Lucky for me, it didn't. I never saw that thing again. And now, when I get off the bus... I take a totally different route home, one that takes me as far as possible away from the woods. Today's account comes from a couple who lived in Phoenix, Arizona for their first year of marriage, Todd and Erica. The two met in college while attending Arizona State University, and they decided to stay close to the area for a bit after graduating. Todd was working for LifeWell Healthcare Agency and Behavioral Center as an accountant, and Erica worked as a nurse at Phoenix Memorial Center. They both loved the outdoors, but they were getting tired of the heat in Arizona. They also felt like the area they were living in was getting more and more crowded, and they were being drawn to live in an area with more space, especially more outdoor opportunities. Without much thought, they decided on moving up to Oregon. Erica's parents lived in Tillamook, Oregon, and so the decision was easy. Basically, they wanted to be closer to family, somewhat in part because they eventually wanted to start a family of their own. So they both sent out job applications, and Todd quickly landed a job as an accounting technician at the treasurer's office, and Erica was hired as a nurse at Adventist Health Hospital. The move wasn't too bad. Not very stressful, since they hadn't really collected many belongings yet and never really dug their feet in in Arizona. Within months, they were able to move and started settling in in Oregon. They had a pretty easy time getting used to their new jobs and making new friends. As they suspected, they loved living there, and they loved exploring the surrounding area. It was close to both forested areas and the beach, which suited them just fine. But something seemed to be missing now that they were settling down. But they both knew it wasn't yet time for a baby. So within the first month of moving in, they decided to rescue a dog. A border collie named Waylon. Waylon was as happy as could be. You could tell that he was thrilled to finally be in a loving home and was completely full of energy. So almost every day after work, Erica would drive the 18 minutes or so to Short Beach and walk with him along the sand and the rocks. She looked forward to their walks and the relaxing sound of the ocean and walking along the rocky beach. There was even a man-made waterfall there and a huge sea cave that you can only get to at low tide. On this particular day, they were driving along the final stretch of road and were almost to the trailhead leading down to the beach when Erica noticed that the wind changed and it seemed to be coming in from another direction. She didn't give it much thought at the time and was also distracted by trying to find parking along the main road at the top of the trailhead. Parking was basically just a small pool out along the side of the road and not a proper parking area. Luckily, she found what seemed to be the last bit of an area available along the road. She parked the car and headed to the trailhead. The trailhead led down to the beach and was basically just a small sign next to steep wooden stairs that wound their way back and forth along the hillside until it finally reached the beach below. The entrance was so nondescript that it would have been easy to miss it if you didn't know it was there. Waylon knew the drill well. He bounded down the steps first. Erica and Waylon played a bit on the sand, running back and forth, playing fetch. All the while, Erica was again aware of the strange feeling to the breeze. And now it almost felt like it had stopped, which is obviously a very strange thing to happen along the ocean. It was weird enough for her to get this super creepy feeling on the back of her neck. And so after watching the sun start to go down, she felt it would be best to head back home. 
so she called Waylon over to her. They headed back towards the stairs. But as they were leaving the beach, she saw something out of place over by the water. She squinted, and it was a dog, a big one too. But there was no one else around, and the only other people nearby were a ways down the beach. In those first few seconds, it looked like it was just someone's dog heading out towards the water. But Erica was worried that it had gotten away from someone. And so she decided to walk over to it to check for a tag or a collar. But as she started towards it, the dog stood itself up on its hind legs and it towered above her. This couldn't be a dog. It was too big. She could now see that it was something else entirely not a pet dog, maybe a wolf. It was the only plausible answer that her brain could come up with. It was taller than any dog she'd ever seen, and its fur was matted and dirty. Its eyes were wild and feral, and it was obvious that it wasn't happy being in the same space as her. Erica's mind was firing in all directions. Now the creature looked like a werewolf, and her heart raced as adrenaline started pumping through her veins. Her mind swirled with thoughts of what could happen to her. And right then, the creature charged at her. She screamed, partly out of fear, partly out of surprise that this was actually even happening. And she started running back towards the stairs. She turned around to look for Waylon. She saw that the dog was right behind her, running too, with Waylon rushing up behind it. She screamed again, and this time people down the beach turned around to look. Waylon was barking wildly at the creature, and it finally stopped, but it stood its ground growling and snarling. Erica was standing there terrified, thinking for sure that this thing was going to kill her. But then, something miraculous happened. To this day, Erica says she wishes she knew what happened, like if it was something she did or what. But the creature slowly backed away, keeping her in its sights the whole time. She watched it as it backed up until it came to an outcropping and darted away out of sight. Where did it go? she thought. Or more importantly, where did it come from? Erica and Waylon ran back up the stairs, zigzagging their way back up the hill into her car. It was honestly the stuff of nightmares. They reached the top, and Erica fumbled for her keys in her zipped jacket pocket, shaking yet quickly trying to get the car door opened and get them inside. Once in the car, she turned the key in the ignition, put the car in drive, and hit the gas, turned the wheel, the car spun around in a tight circle in the middle of the road. She was now facing the way back home. She gunned it and the car sped off just as she saw the quickly moving shadow of what looked like the creature hurling itself up and over the hill towards her car. She drove home faster than ever before, burst through the door, screaming and basically incoherently telling Todd what had happened. He didn't believe her at first, but she had terror in her eyes to back up her story and soon they were calling the police and watching the news to see if there were any other sightings. Amazingly, there was another woman. The sighting was from a woman who lived in the area. She lived in the vicinity of Short Beach, and she saw what she described as a huge black dog. But there was no mention of it standing on its hind legs, though. And so the police just dismissed Erica's sighting as a mistake, a trick of the light as the sun was setting. That dismissal led her into anxiety and PTSD that she's still trying to recover from. With no one in authority believing her, she started to doubt herself. Maybe it was just a trick of the light. But without fail, she continued to know in her heart that it really happened. Anyway, in the end, Todd and Erica wanted to share this encounter with us because they know that there are creatures like this running around. And they just want people to be aware of it and to know that others are out there who do believe. Their final message is to believe in yourself. Believe that you saw what you saw, and don't let anybody tell you differently. Hi Lilith. I was walking around in a wooded area one evening with two friends during the summer of 2011. I don't want to disclose exactly where it happened since there's still some strange activity going on now, and I don't want those involved to be at risk. Anyway, 
On this particular night, my friends and I had stupidly decided to take a walk in the woods after happy hour at a local bar. We had nothing else to do and didn't feel quite like going home just yet, and we enjoyed sometimes getting away from the city lights. So we drove off to a local park, parked, got out of the car, and headed down one of the nearby trails. We knew full well that the sign said the park closed at dusk, but after a few beers, we didn't really care about the rules. I know, we were stupid. Anyway, after we got a bit into the woods and away from the city lights with only moonlight, I began to notice what looked like movement of large animals darting around in the woods. I kept getting quick glances of shadows darting around. At first, I thought I was seeing things on account of just leaving happy hour, but once I had my friends look too, we all agreed that something weird was definitely out there. We decided to stop walking and stand in one place, stand in sort of a circle, but with our backs to each other so that we could all see out. We stood there and we watched. However, none of us were in a super patient state of mind and within only about five minutes, it seemed to all of us like nothing more was going to happen. So we all sort of relaxed a bit when all of a sudden, something slid out from behind a tree and charged our circle. It was huge, and it happened so fast that we didn't have time to effectively react. But luckily, my one friend managed to kick the creature with his foot, while the other managed to grab and hold onto the fur on its head. I thought that was a pretty stupid idea, but I was frozen with fear and I had no idea what to do. I literally could not think. All that was flying around in my head was if we would all be able to make it out alive. And that's when the creature that my friend was holding on to started thrashing around and howling, which made me think of a werewolf movie where the creature is actually transforming into a dog. I don't even know if that's a real movie, but I kid you not, that's what came to my head at that moment. Obviously, this thing we were dealing with was huge, and it was able to break free of my friend's grip instantly. Anything could have happened next, but we all watched as it ran off into the woods in the direction that we had previously seen all those figures moving around. My two friends then sprinted out of there, but only because I couldn't move, I stayed back for a moment to try to process what had just happened. I just couldn't believe that my friends had sort of fought back at this thing. It was crazy. Anyway, I was finally able to run back to the car and I jumped in, joining the other two who had run off before me. I was so shaken up that I didn't even think about yelling at them about leaving me back there. And I just sat there for a few minutes trying to calm down before I could even function enough to start and drive the car. I asked them what they both thought we had just seen. They both thought either dog man or werewolf. But none of us was really versed at the time on these things, and so none of us was exactly sure. I didn't really want to think about it anymore right then, so I just turned on the car and started driving out of the park. I really don't know what to think of what we all saw. Part of me wonders if we saw the only one, or if there are more that we didn't see. But all three of us saw all those creepy shadows, and we all have the same memories. So it must be true that there were more than just one? But let me tell you, what happened to us is certainly not something you want to have happen to you, especially when you are in a dark forest. All three of us are still affected by that night, and it's one experience that I'll never be able to forget, even if I wanted to. Lastly, I'll share with you that I'm a bit worried about the future. I'm pretty sure those things don't fear the human race, and I have a feeling that they're going to be way more dangerous. Our next encounter comes to us from Utah's Zion National Park, one of the oldest inhabited places in the United States. Habitation there started roughly 8,000 years ago with small groups of Native American families. Although Zion is a relatively small park as far as national parks go, it's still one of the most popular in the United States. It's estimated that over 4 million people visited the park in 2019. However, Zion is not to be taken lightly. It can also be dangerous there. 
In 2017, there were 17 search and rescue operations conducted in the park. More recent numbers are yet unknown. One of those cases was the disappearance of a woman in her 30s named Amanda. Amanda was an experienced hiker who had visited Zion many times before. That summer, she called her mom to tell her she was planning a solo hike there. Now, this was not unusual for her since she was an experienced hiker and had done this kind of thing before, even many times at Zion, since she lived just north of Las Vegas. However, her mom had a bad feeling about it that day, even though she didn't know why and asked her not to go. Amanda reassured her mom that she would be fine, and she insisted that she knew what she was doing and that she would call when she got back to cell service. But that was the last time anybody ever heard from her. The last known footage of Amanda was of her hiking in the background of another hiker's video, about a mile from where her boots were ultimately found. The footage showed her walking alone on the trail, but there's no way to know what happened to her after she walked off camera. A massive search effort was launched when her mother reported her missing. The search party looked for her day and night. Flyers were posted, but they couldn't find any trace of her. They scoured the park, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. There was no sign of a struggle, no footprints leading away from the boots. It was as if she had just taken them off and walked away in her socks. But because her boots were found, the search party surmised that she had to be somewhere in the park. They just didn't know where. The search for Amanda went on for weeks, but no further evidence was found. Park authorities started to wonder if she had somehow left the park on her own or if possibly somebody had abducted her. But still, the boots found left behind didn't add up. Even after the official search was called off, Amanda's mother refused to give up hope. She set up residence near the park and continued to comb the park herself day after day in the desperate hopes of finding her daughter. But sadly, Amanda was never found and her case remains unsolved. Conspiracy theorists who have homed in on the boots being left behind have postulated that she was abducted by aliens. Some theories are less far-fetched and instead suggest that she merely took off her boots to adjust something, walked around a bit, but lost her footing and fell into one of the nearby canyons. Others still believe that she was taken by a cult or murdered The list of theories goes on and on. But the truth is that nobody really knows what happened to Amanda. She simply disappeared in Zion National Park, never to be seen again. So if you're planning on hiking in Zion, please remember that it is beautiful, but potentially dangerous. Stay on the trails, hike with a partner, and let somebody know where you are going and when you expect to be back. Most importantly, If you see something suspicious, say something. You could save a life.